Hello and welcome. I'm Professor Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which the University and its several campuses stand. The Wurundjeri people, the Boon people, the Dja Dja Wurrung people and the Yorta Yorta peoples. I pay my respects to Indigenous Elders across Australia, past, present and emerging. An event like today's really demonstrates the unique ability of great universities to bring together the very best experts in the world to tackle the world's hardest problems. So welcome to everyone who is part of this important global conversation today, and especially to Dr. Anthony Fauci. People everywhere noted with sadness the recent passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a rare figure who rose above the partisan divides, though not above controversy, and run respect everywhere. I think after RBG, the only comparable figure in American public life in terms of, re uh, of respect from all sides for his knowledge and intellect and readiness to speak the truth is perhaps Dr. Anthony Fauci. He is with us today and a very warm welcome to you. I have never met Dr. Fauci personally, but I have been in the same room as him on a number of occasions at microbiology conferences in the USA. He is a true great in the field of infectious diseases and it is a great honour that he has chosen to join us for this discussion today. I'll hand over now to my colleague, Professor Kapoor, to tell us more about the series and to introduce Dr. Fauci properly. Thank you, Duncan. Hello and greetings all. My name is Shidaj Kapoor and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. Now, earlier this year, we hosted a series and we called it Life Beyond Coronavirus, and somewhere in June, we ended the series. We thought maybe the worst was over and life was going to get back to some kind of normal. Well, how wrong we were. Life in Australia and life across the world may not return back to normal for quite some time. What happens globally will determine our fate locally. So we've decided to reach out to leaders across the world and invite them to discuss the issues as they see them. And we are honored that the first such leader we have reached out to needs no introduction. Dr. Anthony Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the United States. He is a world leading researcher and as Professor Maskell said, a pioneer in the study and treatment of HIV. Now, Dr. Fauci has advised six US presidents from Reagan to Trump and many affectionately call him America's first doctor we might as well call you the world's first doctor. So it is my honor to host a conversation with Dr. Fauci and Professor Sharon Lewin, and we will also be able to take your questions using the Q&A function. So with those words, a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Fauci. I realize it's a good evening to you and a good morning to all our listeners here in Melbourne and Australia. Dr. Fauci, can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dr. Kapoor. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much. It is only fitting. But let me start with the concept of normal that everyone is wondering about. Uh, what do you think the new normal will look like? What will it look like next year? What might it look like three years from now? No, I think you said it correctly that it's going to be some time till we get back to what we considered normal before December 2019. And I think that will not happen abruptly. It will happen gradually, probably very much stimulated by what I hope will be the successful implementation of a COVID-19 vaccine campaign globally. Because if you vaccinate in one country and the rest of the world continues to have a pandemic outbreak, inevitably all countries will again be involved. I would imagine, at least in the United States, the way things are looking, that if we get a vaccination campaign and by the second or third quarter of 2021, we have vaccinated a substantial proportion of the people, I think it will be easily by the end of 2021 and perhaps even into the next year before we start having some semblances of normality. And it really depends on what you mean by normal. I mean, yes. if normal means you can get people into theater without worrying about um, what we call congregate setting super infections, if you can get restaurants to open at almost full capacity, if you could have sporting events to be able to be played with spectators, either in the stands or in the arena, 
then I think that's going to be well, well into 2021 and perhaps beyond. I think one of the things that will be clear that our sensitivity to the potential devastating effects of a pandemic will be extraordinarily uh, heightened. And I don't think that we will have the normal way of interacting with each other, uh, particularly in the sense of wearing masks, which I think will become very commonplace as it is in many countries in Asia, even outside of the context of a pandemic outbreak. Again, now, I think it's going to be many months. Now, Dr. Fauci, you said something very interesting there. You said that you expect that our sensitivity to this might heighten. One could have well said, well, it might habituate. And we say, oh, well, you know, it's a virus with some mortality, but most of us are going to be all right. But you think it's going to be quite the opposite? I do. I do. I mean, I, I, one of the real problems with the messaging that all of us, I'm sure you yourself, Dr. Kapoor, in, in Australia and in the United States is to get people uniformly to appreciate the potential seriousness of this because of all the viruses that I've dealt with over the decades, I have never seen a situation with such a broad range of manifestations from 40% of the people having no symptoms to the majority of symptomatic people having mild to moderate symptoms to 20 to 25% of people getting so severe disease that you have deaths, the likes of which in the United States, as of last night, there were 225,000 deaths with many more expected as we go into the winter. And yet there are some people, particularly young people who feel if I get infected, the likelihood is that I won't have any symptoms of, or if I do, they'll be very mild. That makes it very difficult to get a uniform, consistent message about seriousness of this. That's the problem. Now, putting your crystal ball, and, and you've given us a sense of what 2021 might look like, but assuming that we do get one of these good vaccines and assuming that we do share it around the world, um, when might we be back in theaters again? Yeah, I think we'll be gradually back. I think we'll be back in theaters with spaced seating and perhaps masks, clearly by maybe the third quarter of 2021. In theaters with no masks at maximum capacity, I think it's gonna be well over a year. And, and tell us a little bit about your thoughts as to what offices might look like. I, I see you're in a wonderful office with books and a sporting jersey behind you. Uh, all of us used to have offices quite like that, but uh, we are here in Melbourne and most of us are not in our offices. Um, what's your sense of what office life might look like, particularly where there is some optionality because we're kind of doing things through Zoom now? Well, this is my home office. Ah, <laughs> Most of the day today, I was in my NIH office and it was like uh, com almost completely empty except for maybe one or two individuals. Um, what I think is going to happen, and it's I don't know if it's a positive or a negative offshoot of this, that we've realized that many things that we can do virtually almost as well as in person. I think we're gonna see a lot of travel that we used to do to go to a meeting or to go to a conference or just to meet with someone will likely be substituted by much more of what you and I are doing now. I would not like to see that disappear completely because there is a certain importance, at least in the scientific community that Sharon and I are used to, and you yourself, I'm sure, of that personal interaction where collaborations are developed and, and, uh, and relationships are, are found and bonded when you're personally. But I think many things like, for example, in my own country, when I'm in Washington, DC, to go up to New York for a meeting with someone for two hours to get on a plane and come back, it's just as easy to sit in front of a Zoom and do it. I think that's gonna change regarding the role of what you do in your job in your office. Now, you're quite right, and, and we've experienced it here. We used to kind of fly to Canberra, our capital, for a one-hour meeting. It used to take half a day to do that. Uh, so we'll probably all reconsider that. But then what might be lost? 
you know, what is it that we used to capture by being in the same room that you think might be not the same? Well, I think there will be a significant loss if we if we go over to the other side too much. I think the body language that you get personally is a bit different than the body language you get over a screen. Um, the feeling of warmth and connectivity when you're next to someone's a little bit different, I think, than what you and I are, are experiencing now as we go back and forth. So I would hope that we don't go too much to the extreme and abandon the in-person, person-to-person relationships. I think it's probably much more compelling to make sure in our school children that we don't get used to being th- doing things virtually because psychologists tell us that the physical interaction with mm-hmm. children in school is very important to their development. So for them, I'm concerned if we get too much to the right. virtual things as opposed to in person. That's right. Well, on that on that note, could I draw you out on you said theaters may take a long time and we can perhaps all live with that. Not perfect, but it's a reasonable compromise. Schools, of course, are very important. What would be your prediction for schools in 2021? Um, well, we in the United States are trying as best as possible to get the children back to school. The only issue that we have is that when you're talking about K through 12 children who are going to a school in a neighborhood that they live in, it depends really on what the level of infection is. We, we label it by colors in the United mm-hmm. States. You know, dark green is really good. Green is good. Yellow, orange, and then red. If you're in a red zone, it's going to be very difficult to get children back to school normally. If you're in a green or a dark green or a yellow zone with some modification, like I don't know what's going on in Australia, but we have a hybrid thing where part of the classes are virtual, part are in person. We alternate days. One day, one group goes in. The next day, another group goes in. Or they alternate morning, afternoon, things like that. We're trying to get them back to school as best as we can. Thank you. And and on that issue, on the Australian perspective, uh, Dr. Fauci, may I welcome to our panel uh, a friend and a colleague and a fellow scientist of yours, uh, Professor Sharon Lewin. She's the director of the Peter Doherty Institute of Infection and Immunity, which is a joint venture between the University of Melbourne and the Royal Melbourne Hospital. She is, like you, an infectious diseases expert and a basic scientist, and many would certainly say she's Australia's first doctor and scientist. So a very warm welcome to you, Sharon. Thanks very much, Tish, and uh, good evening, Tony. Great to see you. Same here, Sharon. Now, Great to see you. Now, both of you, of course, uh, you know, used to focus on HIV AIDS and have made remarkable discoveries there. You've seen the role of drugs in AIDS. You've seen the role of vaccine that never came in AIDS. You've seen the tremendous role of behavior change. And most would say that that's a pandemic that we pretty much successfully gotten on top of. So what do you think we've learned from that that we should now be thinking about as we uh, come to COVID? And perhaps, Sharon, we could start with you first and then get Dr. Fauci on this. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Shatish. Um, I'll start by saying I still work on HIV, still a very important and major pandemic, 37 million people living with HIV. So we can't forget that that still continues sure. even with COVID. Um, what have we learned from HIV? I think, number one, science matters. Uh, science absolutely turned around HIV. Um, it turned around the way we treat people, which transfer, transformed HIV from a death sentence to um, people having normal life expectancy. Turned away the way we diagnose HIV, incredible innovations and um, changes in testing, which are also now being used in COVID. Um, leadership matters. Um, you know, we've seen countries that have got huge burdens of HIV that are doing extraordinarily well, like um, South Africa, parts of Asia. Um, leadership in Australia made a very big difference to um, to how we respond to HIV. And I think the big lesson that um, I know uh, Tony feels passionate about as well is um, partnerships with community, that you can't do this Um, top down. Uh, You need bottom up and partnerships and community. And finally, I think what HIV has done really well is global collaboration. And there's some great, great 
stories about how um, people have, countries have banded together, rich and poor, to overcome issues like access and equity. And I think that's going to be a very big issue now with COVID as well. Mm. Dr. Fauci, what are the positive and perhaps the negative lessons we can learn from HIV? <laughs> well, the one um, I agree completely with everything that Sharon mentioned. I would underscore one of them that's really, really important and that I'm sure Sharon would agree is the role of science in getting us through this. Um, if you look at the investments that we made in the development of effective therapies for HIV, that is unquestionably one of the greatest success stories, I believe, in the history of medicine to take a disease as potentially devastating as HIV AIDS and, and bring it to the point where if a person is diagnosed, gets on therapy, now one pill with three drugs in it, you can have that person lead essentially a normal life. The same thing I think holds true with COVID. One of the things that I really believe is gonna be important is that in addition to a vaccine, which would really be the showstopper for COVID, uh, I believe that if we put the resources into developing direct antivirals, similar to what we did with HIV, so that if you can make a quick diagnosis of a symptomatic person with COVID and treat them, and you probably would only have to treat them literally for a few days, not what we have to do with HIV, which is lifetime, just for a few days with a combination of potent antivirals, we could really take away the fear and the dread of this particular disease. So that's something that we are pushing. Right now, if you look at therapy early on, we have better therapies for advanced disease when you're on a, right. a ventilator, things like dexamethasone, which is shown to be quite effective in dampening the aberrant hyperimmune or hyperinflammatory response. We need, that. We need uh, therapies early. Monoclonal antibodies appear to be promising. We have a number of randomized placebo-controlled trials now going on in the United States for that, as well as things like convalescent plasma and hyperimmune globulin. Uh, one of the things that we learned uh, very, very much with HIV is engagement of the community and how it's important. Uh, right now in our own country, in the United States, we have a, an extraordinary disparity in illness hospitalizations and death, arguing against the uh, minorities. The African-Americans have like five or six times the likelihood mm. of getting hospitalized and at least two to three times the likelihood of dying. The same with our Latinx community. And we've got to learn to engage better and, and also maybe shine a, a big bright light on the social determinants of health, Absolutely. which allow the Latinx and the African-Americans to be susceptible to the difficult mm -hmm. circumstances on the basis I, of their underlying comorbidities. Can I come to that? I'll extend that in a moment, but I first wanted to come to perhaps a lesson from HIV about what did not happen. We didn't get the vaccine, uh, or at least we haven't gotten it as yet, or an effective one. Um, what's the difference? We're, we're all much more optimistic about this coronavirus vaccine, but... 30 years and no vaccine for HIV, what does that teach us? Well, that tells us that the body is a pretty good concept prover. What I mean by that <laughs> is that if your body makes a good immune response against natural infection, it tells you that the body is capable of mounting an effective immune response. If you look at all the diseases for which we have successful vaccines, smallpox, polio, measles, despite the morbidity and mortality associated with those diseases, the majority of people recover spontaneously because their immune system mounts an effective response to clear the virus and then ultimately to protect you against reinfection. Unfortunately for the human species, that's not the case with HIV. The body does not like to make an effective immune response against HIV. Sure. In addition, HIV integrates itself into the genome of a cell very, very quickly. We've shown and other labs have shown within a very short period of time following infection, you have a reservoir that we thus far have not been successful in eliminating. 
For that reason, it makes it very, very difficult. With coronaviruses, we know that most people spontaneously recover from coronavirus infection, which means their body has proven the concept that the body is capable of making an effective immune response. So if the body can do it to natural infection, we can do it with a vaccine. And I believe that's the reason why we've been trying to get a vaccine for HIV for so many decades, and we have not been successful. Whereas I'm telling you, we will have a vaccine for coronavirus in the next few months. I'm fairly certain yeah, in, of that. In the wonderful way that you've explained it, I think you've raised optimism on, on all fronts. Though, you know, the challenge won't be just getting the vaccine. The challenge will be getting people to take it. And uh, it has been rather surprising to see that at least the polls done at the moment, um, and surprisingly more so in Western nations than in less developed nations, are showing that there is a skepticism about vaccines. Uh, people are worried about their safety. There are exaggerated fears uh, about you know, whether people will take them or not take them. What's your sense of if we did get one and it got approved through the proper, pro proper processes of the FDA and everything else, what would be the response in terms of people taking it? Well, right now there is a reluctance to take vaccines. We have an anti-vaccine movement in the United States that dates back to anti-vax for measles, mumps, rubella. But right now there is a skepticism that we have to reach out to the community to overcome, partly fueled by what I'm sure you're, you're hearing about, even though you're very far away geographically, about mixed signals that are coming out from the government, uh, which is not being very helpful. Dr. Fauci, no one is very far away from that, I can assure you. It's right in our <laughs> drawing rooms, but please continue. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're absolutely correct. So we really need to be extremely transparent, which we will be in the analysis of the data through the data and safety monitoring boards, which will be able to evaluate intermittently the data as they come in to the advisory committees, to the career scientists at the FDA, so that if a vaccine gets approved, as you said, with all the right approaches, that hopefully in our transparency, we'll be able to convince people to get vaccinated. And I think what will happen is that there will be a reluctance on the part of a certain proportion of the population. But as more and more people get vaccinated and show that it's safe, and show that it's diminishing the incidence of infection. I think more and more people will want to come in to get vaccinated. Right, thank you. Now, we have a number of questions coming in, and there are so many that I'm actually paraphrasing them for you. Sharon, what's, uh, what's your sense about the sort of Australian context of vaccine acceptance versus hesitancy? We also have vaccine hesitancy. It's everywhere. I think I think overall there's probably higher trust in science at the moment, and we also have a very different outbreak, of course, in COVID-19 to what um, Dr. Fauci is describing in the US. There will be, there is vaccine hesitancy. There's been some work done on it from the University of Sydney. About 20, 30% of people are hesitant to have a COVID vaccine. It's linked to education, more hesitant to lower education. It's linked to your experience with flu vaccine. If you had a flu vaccine before, you're more likely to want to have a COVID vaccine. I don't think also we need to vaccinate everyone is the current predictions as opposed to some infectious diseases such as measles where you really do need very high vaccine uptake because it's so infectious. We may not need to vaccinate every person that, you know, the predictions are 60 to 70 percent is who we need to vaccinate. And also it's important to realise that the first generation vaccines largely protect against disease, um, not infection, meaning they stop you getting virus in the lungs, they don't stop you getting virus in the nose as efficiently. And so therefore they stop you from getting sick. So we really want people to get vaccinated who will get benefit from that, meaning people that are more likely to get sick. So the target population is a little different to say how we think about measles vaccine where we want to vaccinate absolutely everyone. Right. Now, now you raised the very interesting point of, you know, public having credibility. And I think it's really people like you to whom the public uh, looks to credibility. And it would be fair to say that, you know, in this pandemic, perhaps more than many others, uh, politicians love to appear with people like you on their side, um, so long as you're, you're telling a story that they like. Um, so what do you think this has done to the role of the medical expert, which used to be, I would say, a more hidden role? 
You know, medical experts used to advise from behind. Now they're side to side. At one level, that's wonderful for getting public credibility, but it also starts giving it political overtones. So, Dr. Fauci, you probably uh, know this well. What are your thoughts on what it means to be a public expert now, and how is it working out? Well, it's working out uh, with some bumps, and the bumps are that you have to be always letting the data and the science guide your recommendation. You need to be humble enough to know that you don't know everything at any given time. You need to be flexible enough to know that as more data evolves, you may need to change your recommendation. And the critical issue is that when you are involved, as you said, on the same podium with politicians, you, you should never be afraid to tell somebody something that they may not like to hear. And one of the traps that some scientists get into is that they like the idea about having impact at the national and global level. And sometimes they might hesitate to say something that is not popular to the politician. You should always remember that in order to maintain your credibility, you've got to continue to speak consistently based on the science. The science guides what we're going to do and what we are doing. That is really, really important. The other thing I think that you're important is that when you're communicating it as a scientist, one of the things you've got to try and do is that the purpose of your communication is not to impress people about how smart you are. The purpose is to get them to understand what the heck you're talking about. So often <laughs> scientists get in a situation, they try to be very, very arcane in how they present it, and nobody has any idea what they're talking about. That's a problem, because if they don't understand you, they say, those scientists, they don't know what they're talking about. We can't understand them. You've got to make sure you don't talk down to people but you've got to make sure they understand what you're talking about. And you, of course, do that so well, Dr. Fauci, and you're a wonderful role model for the generation of scientists who will follow you. But I think you brought up a very big element there about speaking truth to power. That's been hard for mankind all along, and it'll continue to be hard. But I think the other aspect that you pointed out to was the sort of humility and fallibility of science. Now, this is what is sometimes hard for people to get. They expect science to the clear, dichotomous, black and white answers. And of course, the answers of science are often probabilistic. Uh, how, how does one get that concept across to people and yet get them to have credibility in it? Well, it's not easy, uh, particularly if you've got to explain that if you are trying to scientifically navigate through an evolving situation that information changes. It isn't static. If you look at what we knew in the first few weeks of the outbreak and what we know now, things that we said early on then are not the same as what we're saying now because the situation has changed. So you've got to get people to understand just what you're saying. Science is a dynamic process, and it's self-correcting. Uh, mm. It just is self-correcting, and that's the thing that people need to understand. Now, um, you know, all said and done, uh, you've given us reasons for hope and optimism, but also reasons for caution. Um, but we all seem to think the vaccine will come. How confident are you that the vaccine will be made globally available? Well, I certainly hope that it will. And what I've seen thus far makes me feel reasonably confident that it will. Let me explain why. The United States has invested hundreds of millions, if not billions and billions of dollars in helping to subsidize pre-buy, pre-develop uh, pre doses of vaccines. The companies that we're involved with are making vaccine doses, not just for the United States, which would be measured in hundreds of millions, but some companies such as Janssen, Johnson & Johnson 
are talking about the capability of making billions of doses. So when you're talking about billions of doses, we're talking about trying to get an equitable distribution. And I think that, as I've said all along, it sometimes makes me unpopular in some circles and popular in other circles. I believe that the rich countries of the world, including the United States, have almost a moral obligation to make sure that when you're dealing with something like a life-saving vaccine, that we have an obligation to make sure that countries that generally don't have the resources to get that do have the availability. That was the entire rationale and moving force for why we developed the PEPFAR program, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Because President Bush at the time said, just because a country is poor and doesn't have resources, doesn't mean they should die from a disease that we could help them with merely by getting them the resources in the form of drugs and prevention. I think the same is gonna hold true for vaccines for COVID. And, and um, Sharon, you, what, oh, yes. Oh, I was just gonna say, it's also worth mentioning, you know, there are entities like, such as COVAX, which is an alliance between Gavi, Global Alliance of Vaccines, um, WHO, and CEPI, with the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, an organisation that was established to actually develop vaccines. And it's because of that investment that was done several years ago that many groups could rapidly pivot to start developing coronavirus vaccines. Um, COVAX, which Australian government is contributing to, along with about 70 other governments, allow, will allow for procurement of the best vaccines and hopefully good pricing and then allocation to both rich and poor vaccines. Because as Dr. Fauci said earlier, you know, if we're just going to vaccinate our own countries and we're not going to get out of this position, you know, we've got to get that vaccine into um, rich and poor countries around the world. That's right. Now, speaking of doctor, uh, of other countries, uh, Dr. Fauci, it's not very polite to ask a guest to comment on yourself. It puts them in a difficult spot, but you're used to difficult spots. So when you look around the world, uh, how do you think Australia has done? Australia is one of the countries that has done actually quite well, I, I believe. Um, well, you're a wonderful guest, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they have. Australia's done well, New Zealand has done well. Uh, some of the Asian countries have done well. If you look, I mean, I would like to say the same for the United States, but the numbers speak for themselves. You know, we have almost 9 million infections, 8.7 million infections. We have 225,000 deaths, and we are essentially still uh, going on a day-by-day -day basis, getting worse and worse. Uh, at a Senate hearing a few months ago, uh, upon questioning by United States senators, I said, although it pains me to say this, if we do not do something different than what we're doing right now, we could reach 100,000 cases a day. And two days ago, we were up to 83,000 cases in a single day. Mm. That is very troubling. That's no, really quite, troubling. we've no, got to do better than that. You're quite right in pointing out that our numbers look good. Would you speculate as to how and why? Uh, what, I mean, at some level, it's right that we control the infection, but why did things turn out to be different for Australia, because the science was relatively universal. Everyone had pretty much similar access to science and knowledge. Um, do you see some patterns amongst the countries who've done better than others? Well, I think, you know, geographically and otherwise, the ability to um, contain within one's country, when you have a country like Australia, which is a gigantic island, <laughs> it's, it's, it's probably, it's easier to contain sure in sure. and out, whereas in, in the United States, that's not the case. You know, we have northern and southern borders and the southern border particularly is, is problematic because Mexico has had a real difficult problem also uh, with COVID-19. But the other thing that I think people need to appreciate about the United States is that by the very nature of how our country was formed by the founding fathers, it is the United States of America and the states by this process called federalism have the ability to do things independently even though we have a central government. And if ever there was a situation where you wanted consistency throughout the country, where when you say, this is what we're gonna do, everybody does it. 
Unfortunately, although there's many positive aspects about the independence of the different states in doing things the way they want to do it, when you're dealing with a pandemic and you say, we want everybody to do A, B, and C, and all of a sudden state number 43 does this and state number 27 does that, it becomes very difficult. We saw that very clearly when we were trying to open up the economy again or open up the country. And we did a, and I was very uh, much involved with Dr. Deborah Burks in putting together these guidelines, which were a gateway of phase one, phase two, to tell you how you can gradually, safely and prudently open up the country. That would have been nice if all the states did that the same way. It was like a free-for-all. There were some states that didn't even pay attention. Some states jumped over one benchmark to the other. And some states try to do it well. But yet when you looked at the TV screen, you'd see people crowded at bars with no masks, just essentially causing super spreading. Even though we had the guidelines of universal wearing of masks, keeping distance, avoiding crowded and congregated settings, doing things outdoors more than indoors and washing your hands. If everybody had done that uniformly, I don't think we would be in the position we're in right now. Now, uh, I, have to, I have to say that, you know, even we have our states, but we somehow still managed. And so let me turn to Sharon to see, Sharon, what's your thought of how Australia has done well? We know it has. Uh, how did we overcome these differences across states? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, uh, we have five states and two territories. Our public health system's federated in the same way. The premiers, like your governors, can do what they like in their state. Um, but I think we, from the beginning, we had good national leadership. So our prime minister established a cabinet very quickly, meaning that he met with all of those premiers. He couldn't tell them what to do, but um, they were in dialogue very regularly. Um, I think a lot of our policies and our leadership have been driven by science, and I think that has made things easier here. So um, the closing down and opening up the country in that first way was driven by mathematical modelling that was um, infor directly informing national policy. And then, um, Tony, you may not know, but the, um, the rest of Australia effectively eliminated community transmission, except in Victoria, where Melbourne's the capital. And we had a very large outbreak, um, it, it, large for us, 20,000 people in total um, since starting in, in early August. And it's just come to the tail end. And the last two days, we've had zero new infections. And um, again, the response and the government took a very hard line. We've had a lockdown for 12 weeks, which are just emerging from restaurants, are just opening tonight, actually. I'm going out the first <laughs> time for dinner to a restaurant tonight after um, being at home since March. Um, and uh, all of that opening has been driven by the science, it's been driven by mathematical modelling. It's been driving the business communities crazy because they just want to open it, you know, but the government's sat really tightly on, on the science. I think we, the Ireland issue is definitely a big one, that we could close our borders. We closed our borders early, just like you did to China on the 1st of February, but we really closed the borders, meaning that really you couldn't get in. Um, we had testing set up pretty early. Um, back in um, late January, testing was already widely available. And I think, you know, we have a universal health coverage here. We have a very... Um, very robust public health system. Our test trace isolate system was not as good here in Melbourne as it was in Sydney, but we've now invested in that. Um, so I think, you know, there's some of the things. And also, I think actually the it's not just so much the state individualism, it's the individual individualism in the US that's very different. You know, so this idea that you can't tell someone to wear a mask, you might be horrified, Tony, but we have universal mask wearing in Melbourne because you're fined $1,000 if you're outside not wearing them. If you walk on the streets of Melbourne, 99.9% .9 of people are wearing masks. So we did it by fining people. That, I gather, would be very difficult in the US. Could you, could you bring that in? <laughs> that, you know, Sharon, I, I really wish that we could transplant that kind of mentality here because masks in the United States had almost become a political statement yeah. 
Mm. I know that was carried in the news globally. It was really very, very difficult. In fact, people were ridiculed for wearing masks. It depended upon what side of a particular political spectrum you were at, which is so painful to me as a physician, a scientist, and a public health person to see um, such divisiveness centered around a public health issue. I mean, if there's one area of life that there should not be divisiveness is in the health of your nation. And there was, it's just extraordinary. I mean, the vitrialness of this, it was just bad. Yeah, yeah. And you know, actually there was a lot of reluctance to masks initially, just cultural, I'm sure, as you said earlier, Asian countries um, have worn them for years. We, we kind of saw it as something, you know, it was it's something to do with weakness, or I'm not sure what it was, but once it, it overnight, it became, you know, you had to wear a mask. It was actually a painless intervention, you know, mm-hmm. really, and, and effective. In, in the Incredible scheme of it, all the other sacrifices, that, that seemed uh, like a smaller one. But, you know, it, uh, unless you get too utopian a picture of our existence here, Dr. Fauci, we've had, of course, rather robust debates about what is the right balance of lives and livelihoods. And, and I think that debate is far from over because this uh, pandemic is far from over. Um, how do you think of that, Dr. Fauci? How, how does one balance these two imperatives? Well, it's very, very difficult. I mean, we've had the same arguments right now. Um, I think they weren't as uh, transparently honest as they should have been. But there is a very, very strong movement that... Uh, if we damage the economy, that the the, uh, unintended consequences, even on the health of the country, might actually even negate the advantage of the kinds of public health things that you're doing. And it's an ongoing discussion, as you said yourself, uh, it's, it's still being discussed in Australia. It's very, very heavily discussed now. I was literally a couple of hours before I came from the NIH to my home here to pick up this Zoom. I was at a meeting virtually at the Situation Room in the White House talking about the same sort of thing because the economists, they need to understand more like what is the balance? I mean, uh, if you you close down and I never use the word shut down again. I mean, if I were to use the word shut down the country in lockdown, I, I would be in serious trouble. They would probably be throwing tomatoes at me or something. Um, it's the kind of thing that you've really got to try and articulate the importance of walking that fine line of maintaining the public health without so damaging the economy that you're essentially negating the good that you're trying to do. I firmly believe that you can continue to open businesses, that you can continue to open up the country from an economic standpoint, the way you were saying about restaurants and about stores and shops and things like that, without necessarily shutting things down, you could do that. But if you could do it prudently by public health measures that prevent surgeons of infection, we've seen it done before. We've seen, you know, countries and sections of our own country that have done that successfully. We're gonna really be challenged right now. You guys have gone through your winter. I understand you had practically a zero flu season, which we're hoping that we're as lucky as you are. I imagine you had a very, very low flu season because you were practicing public health measures to avoid COVID-19 and you had, you had the secondary effect of preventing influenza. I'm really concerned now because in the next couple of months, we're at the end of October, we go into November. Thanksgiving is one of the most important holidays in the United States. A lot of travel, a lot of family gatherings, and and that's going to be really difficult because we're already seeing in family settings where six to eight people get together for dinner and you have one person who is infected but has no symptoms, the next thing you know, three or four people in that group are infected. And if one or more of them is a vulnerable person, 
that's when you get hospitalizations and even mm-hmm. deaths. Now, so we're going to have a tough time in the next few months. You know, we, we have our most sacred festival here. It's called the Football Finals, and we've just had them last week. So we're past our peak risk period here. Um, but look, I, I, there are a number of questions coming, and I'll just paraphrase them most simply and in an open fashion uh, and turn to you, Sharon. Um, at this point in time, what next thing would you like to know about COVID that you think will help you prepare a better public health response? So what is it that we don't know as yet about COVID that would help you? If you knew the answer to that, that would be so much better in making the public health response. I'll go to you, Sharon, first, and then Dr. Fauci. Um, I think uh, on the public health response, um, our instruments are pretty crude. We kind of throw a ton of things at when, you know, when, when countries really want to get on top of it, we throw a ton of things at this, um, in addition to masks, you know, stopping gatherings, working at home, um, closing schools, you know, all the different things that we've, we did here. And it's a very blunt instrument. And then we peel them back um, one at a time, hoping that we got the one right. And I think if we had a far better quantitative assessment of what we now call non-pharmalo- non-pharmacological intervention, interventions, it would help. I th- we've got some idea, I think, about potentially the impacts um, of masks, but, you know, of this raft of things that we do, I would like to see that more refined. And unfortunately, you know, scientists like to answer questions um, in very precise ways, and we do this by flipping a coin and randomising, you know, to one intervention or another and you get the right answer. We can't get the answer for these non... Can't do that sort of thing for non-pharmaceutical non Non-pharmacological. But what we can do is look at other countries, and that's what we do a lot in Australia, looking at what other people did what worked, what didn't work, and how we can inform our own policy. That that we, I, I hope we'll get a lot more precise on, on those all sort right, of interviews. All right, so you, so you want to know the precise impacts of the different NPIs and then how, how one can combine them to get the perfect public health response. Dr. Fauci, what would you like to know more about COVID that you think would be most helpful? Well, I underscore what, what Sharon said. I totally agree with her on that. One of the things that uh, well, two things that I'd like to know is what the durability of immunity is following infection, because right. if, if the if the, if it's really not very durable, we're going to have a very difficult time over the next few years. Because if somebody's um, antibody response, and we know less about the T cell response, but if someone's response diminishes rapidly, so that after a year or so they're still susceptible to the same virus that they had a year previously, that's gonna be a real problem mm-hmm. because if a, if a coronavirus that can kill you is the same as the coronavirus that causes the common cold, you know, you get re-challenged with the common cold every year, even though you may have gotten it a year ago, you recover, you get it again. That would really be a very, very difficult situation to have a potentially deadly disease that you can continue to have year after year. Wow. That's one thing I'd like to know, and just what the durability is. And we yeah. won't quite yeah. know that until another one or two or three years have passed and we've right. seen the durability of it. Exactly. Of it. The other thing that we're seeing a fair amount of in the United States, only because we have so many cases, is what people are referring to, and I think it's an inappropriate name, as long haulers, or people hmm. who recover virologically, but have a rather substantial persistence of almost debilitating symptoms, shortness of breath, muscle aches, dysautonomia, uh, memory losses, difficulty concentrating. We've seen that in people who've gotten moderately sick and stayed at home. We've seen that in people who've been hospitalized and we've seen that in people who've required intensive care. What we don't know but we're doing a re- very big cohort study right now that we, we started, we're funding it now, looking at the long-term effects because you know there's this issue that people say, well, either you're gonna get killed and you recover or you're gonna be fine. Well, maybe there's a group in there that they get infected, but they're not necessarily gonna be fine. They may have lingering uh, uh, issues symptomatically and otherwise, or 
it may lead to secondary issues later on. I mean, you don't know. I mean, there was a, it was a study from uh, uh, called in the journal JAMA Cardiology where they took people who recovered who were doing fine without symptoms and they did MRIs on their heart and found inflammatory disease in the heart in up to 60% Percent. of the people. Yes. Now that may be irrelevant and it'll just clear itself up with no problem, but I don't know that right now. <laughs> so I don't know what that's going to mean when a high percentage of people who recover have an inflammatory response. Does that mean they're going to be more prone to cardiomyopathies, more prone to arrhythmias? I don't know that. I hope it's going to be an inconsequential finding. But these are things that, as you said, what I We'd wish like I knew. Right. Like, now, now, that's a bit of a scary thing to end on, but I want to end on something positive. And I think if we look back in history, whenever dramatic events like this have happened, they have left the world a little bit better. You know, you go back to the Black Death in Europe, it changed the labor laws. You go back to the Second World War, we got the UN and the WHO. What do you think will be the lasting positive legacy of COVID? You know, I don't know, to be honest with you, but I hope that it is a much stronger commitment to the global interconnectivity that we have, such as the global health security network, the kinds of collaborations that we have, the transparency, the interconnectivity, the communications, that we really are a one world health as opposed to individual countries. Because if ever there's something that shakes you into that, it's a global pandemic that has already affected you know, 30 plus million people and killed over a million globally. And we're not through with it yet by any means. Well, Dr. Fauci, we could go on about this, but it's my very sad duty to bring it all to a close. So can I request all my audience, wherever you are, to join me in thanking Professor Sharon Lewin and Dr. Fauci, and particularly you, Dr. Fauci, for making time late in the evening in this very momentous week uh, in the United States. We're very grateful to you, and I think it would be fair to say the world needs more Fauci. So thank you very much for that. Let me also thank our live audience. I'm sorry that we could not get to all your questions. We could never get to all your questions, but we thank you for your continuing interest. It's been a delight to us to have your interest, and we will always keep looking for ways to bring you the very best perspectives from all around the world, because that is what universities do. So keep safe, stay well, until we can shake hands again, a namaste. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me with you. Thank Sharon, you, Dr. Fauci. I would like to go to dinner with you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love you to. You're welcome anytime. <laughs>